linked above is a film that I made about sampling and sine waves and chopstick covers that was surprisingly popular. It seems that people enjoy watching a man make a total fool out of himself by making up science as he goes along. So I thought I'd have another go at making up science as I went along to discuss a burning subject. 11 years ago, I founded a company called Spitfire Audio with a gentleman called Paul, uh, and we make orchestral samples. One of those will basically, we record orchestral instruments one note at a time so that you can then play them on keyboards. Now, our kind of thinking 11 years ago, which was a bit, a bit of a different way of thinking, was how about we not just sample the instruments, but sample the room that they're in? So what I want to discuss today is why I think rooms are better than reverb. But I'm not in a room at the moment, so that's possibly the first thing we should do. So Paul and I set up this company, Spitfire Audio, and we wanted to record in this big, massive room called the Hall at Air Studios, which is a place that people write for and a place that musicians love playing in. Why is that? Because they love the sound of the room. So when we sampled within that room, we thought, well, we're going to capture it. Now, a lot of people, when we started out, said, well, why don't you just capture the samples dry, so without a room noise, and then just add reverb? I'd like to demonstrate to you why. So this is one of the first libraries we did, orchestral percussion with Joe B. Burgess. Now let's just find the old bass drum. Okay, so let's put on the close mic. Now close mic is a specific type of mic, a little bit like this one, that's designed to record the sound that's just around it, not the whole sound of the room. So it's directional, probably a dynamic mic of some sort. I'm sure Jake will probably correct me. Um, so this is very close to the bass drum and it sounds like this. which is interesting. Now, when you add in the tree mic, that's gonna be further away, but also it's gonna be three microphones, really high quality microphones in what's called an omni pattern, which is basically designed to capture everything that kind of is, is around it. And the tree mic may be 10, 15 feet away. Quite interesting. And then the close and the tree together. Extraordinary. Now, what I'm gonna do is just take the close mic. It's not 100% dry. You can still hear a bit of the decay there. And I'm just gonna add a whole bunch of reverb to that. Something that's similar to the room sound of the hall. So the close and tree. And the close with a kind of matched reverb. I would argue this sounds nice, the close with the reverb, but it just doesn't sound as big, as epic as the tree and the close combined. And in fact, if you listen carefully, the beginning isn't def as defined as it is here. And that's for a number of reasons. The first of which is the distance between the two microphones. So if you look at this drawing, air is roughly kind of hexagonal in shape. And as I mentioned, the close mic is, as suggested, close, and the tree mics are between 10 and 15 meters away. So let's bounce the two signals separately and zoom in here. You'll see that even though I triggered both the notes simultaneously, one happens before the other, and that's why there sounds like a slightly kind of blurred double image. Now, there's a number of reasons why the image is blurred at the beginning, but this dramatic difference here is basically to do with the speed of sound and the fact that sound travels relatively slowly. I think we'll be able to measure, even in this room, that effect. If I put an M149 right in the corner next to my piano over there, and I've got an SM57, trusty one of these, it's going to have a couple of appearances today, right up, pointing away in the corner of the room. You can see the mod really starts around here, which is matched here. So even in this tiny room, there's a difference between the microphones. Okay, so theoretically, we could do something called phaser aligning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this kind of crossing point here, cut it, and align it to there. And this is a technique I believe Deutsche Grammophon adopt for their classical recordings, so all of their mics are phase aligned. Now let's have a listen to that. Does that cancel and match more of a just a standard reverb? Let's have a listen. Compared to... It's closer, but there's still something going on at the beginning that makes this drum sound more epic than the same drum close mic with reverb on. And I think that's something to do with not what the sound's doing when it's going directly from the drum and into the mic, it's what it's doing when it's going in different directions. A drum emits sounds from all sides, in all directions, left, right, up and down. And what happens when sound waves 
clatter into big, sturdy walls is the walls reflect the sound back. And it is this reflection back into these microphones that creates this chaotic and very blurred beginning. There's a duplication of the noise of the drum that creates a kind of epic sound. Then you get this tail, this reverby kind of tail, and that is the uh, reflections diffusing across the entire room. This is when we really play with the height because you have to imagine it's not just reflections work in two dimensions or on the axis of the, of the microphones. It's at all of these gradiated points up the wall. So I have a theory. If we look at these waveforms again, this beginning looks all very, very complicated and then it seems to smooth out. That diffusion occurs there. If I just simply chop off the beginning of this file here, go in there, move that to there. I can maybe try and find a slightly brighter reverb. I'm getting closer. The hall still sounds better. It's an extraordinary sounding space. So the point I'm trying to get to is what reverbs create is the diffusion that a room provides, but not necessarily that complex structure of early reflections that happen particularly on a percussive note at the beginning. You have to imagine a reverb unit that would calculate all of those early reflections going in different directions between different instruments placed at different points in the hall, you know, with their sound travelling in different directions. You know, trumpets, the sound travels very much that way. French horns, the sound travels completely backwards from the back of their horns. So this complex interplay of the early reflections is what makes a room so fantastic over a reverb. The drama the emotion of a sound, the amount of air it's moving, I believe is described in those first initial moments. If it's really loud and percussive, there's a chaotic interplay of signals between the microphones, between the walls, and between the walls and the microphones and the walls and the other walls, which slowly descends and decays into this total chaos that becomes impossible to decode. It just becomes this haze, this diffuse sounds. So for me, so much of the emotion of what you're doing is described in those early reflections within a room. Which is why, for example, I could set up this guitar amp here. So I've basically got a guitar sound coming out here. Got it going into a reamp to adjust the attenuation into a Fender Tweed, and I'm going to overdrive the amp. This is when we bring our trusty SM57 out again. It's great. I mean, for a kind of an 80 quid mic, it's absolutely fantastic. But I'm not entirely convinced that I couldn't have created that effect within the box, within Logic. To me, it doesn't necessarily sound particularly loud. But what I have done is set up this uh, Apollo mic, which is a stereo ribbon mic made by Sontronics that I am, as you probably can tell, a massive fan of, not sponsored by them or anything like that. And I'd be interested to see what it sounds like when we combine oopsie, when we combine that image with that of the SM57, does it become more dramatic? <laughs> Arguably, this isn't a great room to record in, but to me, that has an even trashier, more dramatic quality. You can feel the air being pushed around the amp. In fact, often when I do videos about percussion, I have this disappointing thing when I edit them. I always edit the mic out when it's playing through the speakers. So when I'm just actually getting the kind of takes together, this is what it sounds like, a combination of the direct signal and the signal through the speakers and into this mic. So when I then go to mix it, it sounds like this, just the direct signal. But if I try to reamp that through these speakers, again with this stereo mic, I think that I'll get a much more dramatic sound, even if this room is a bit shit.
this is, I think, me getting to the crux of my point. The reason why rooms are better than reverb is they convey and reflect and amplify not just the sound of the instrument, but the sound of the performance. If you allow yourself to sing out, the room sings out with you. It's an amplifier of emotion. I've recorded countless numbers of violins in a space like this, and their performance will never be as good as it is in, say, Wigmore Hall or Air Studios. It's just a fact. If something makes you feel good, you'll do a gooder job. So this is where I think it becomes very interesting and a dichotomy maybe when you're dealing with samples and live musicians. I think this is a good example of that. I was working on a uh, quite a cinematic piece, but we could only afford a quartet recorded in a small room. So just have a listen to the samples which were recorded in Air Studios. I always add just a little bit of uh, reverb to glue it together. This is what uh, professional engineers do, so don't be scared of that. And this is what we recorded first dry. I've separated them off onto different stems so that we can mix them individually. So this is the real, just beautiful quartet of very talented players. Great, and that's recorded in a relatively small room at Adele Studios. So what I found with professional engineers is they tend to kind of favour where the money has gone. So usually when you forked out for some live orchestral players, they tend to favour that. And I would suggest when they mix it, it would usually be this kind of balance. But for me, this still doesn't have the emotional impact of a lot of people moving a lot of air in the room. So I tend to be, and as you can see with this cue, there's a lot of automation just to keep the, the live strings just as a thin veneer on the top of the sample stuff. And as you, you'll hear, as I move these samples up, I feel that you'll feel a kind of a greater emotional pull more emotional than the samples on their own, more emotional than the players on, on their own. You're playing the, the, the effect of a live player leaning into the notes and the impact of a lot of players playing in a big room and the emotional effect that that has. Listen, particularly around here, when we go up a register, it really does kind of soar a bit more. Thanks, as always, for watching. I'd be fascinated to hear about your thoughts on rooms versus reverbs and ways in which you make reverbs sound more convincing in the comments down below. Alongside any requests you have for subjects where I can make up science as I go along. If you haven't subscribed yet, be churlish not to. Lots of exciting stuff coming up. Uh, ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time I put up a video on one of those. Much appreciated if you've enjoyed this one. See you next time.